From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. The name Giffords now graces a room in the U.S. Capitol building. We'll take you to the ceremony. Plus, a baker refusing to make a wedding cake for a same-sex couple. How attorneys are preparing to take the case to our nation's highest court. And cybersecurity. With holidays around the corner, you may be preparing to shop online. This facility is teaching the public how to battle cyber attacks. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Madison Connor. And I'm Tyler Finger. Thank you for joining us. Former Arizona Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords was back on Capitol Hill today where friends and former colleagues met to rename the Democratic cloakroom in honor of her and the late Congressman Leo Ryan, both victims of targeted violence. Cronkite News reporter Trevor Fay is live in our Washington newsroom after attending the event. Trevor? Gabrielle Giffords returned to Washington today to have a cloakroom named in her honor. It's been more than five years since she walked the halls of Congress, but that has not decreased the admiration that people around here have for the former Tucson Congresswoman. A bipartisan crowd of about 100 turned out to honor Giffords, who was shot in a 2011 assassination attempt. For Arizona Senator Jeff Flake, the memory of that day still brings back emotions. I immediately jumped in my car and drove toward Tucson only to hear on the way the erroneous report that uh, Gabby had passed on. Six people were killed in that attack and 13 wounded, including Giffords, who admitted to the crowd that she still has difficulty speaking to this day. But speak she did. I'm still fighting to make the world a better place, and you can too. Get involved with your community. Be a leader, set an example. The naming ceremony honored Giffords and slain California Congressman Leo J. Ryan Jr. This week marks the 39th anniversary of his assassination while investigating the Jonestown cult compound in Guyana. A former member of Giffords staff said that being recognized alongside Ryan means a lot to the former congresswoman. She's incredibly honored to share uh, the, the naming of the cloakroom with Congressman Ryan, who was also committed to representing his constituents. This is the second room in the Capitol to be named in honor of a victim of that shooting. Gifford staffer Gabe Zimmerman, who died in the attack, was also honored in 2011. Florida Congresswoman Debbie Worserman Schultz said there are very few rooms in the Capitol building named to honor individuals. Schultz, a longtime friend of Giffords, said Giffords deserves it. It's recognition of what she meant to this institution, what she meant to the people of Arizona. Um, I think it symbolizes her integrity and her goodness. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi, who led the ceremony, says Giffords continues to awe with her exceptional courage and efforts to build a better America. Gifford said in a statement that while her time in Congress is over, she'll never stop serving the American people. I'm working hard, lots of therapy, speech therapy, physical therapy, and yoga too. <laughs> but my spirit's strong as ever. In a statement released by her organization, Gifford says that she hopes all future conversations in the cloakroom will help inspire action that leads to a brighter and safer future. Live in Washington, Trevor Fay, Cronkite News. Also today, Senator Flake joined two other senators in sending a letter to the Secretary of Defense raising questions about how military agencies are reporting domestic violence-related convictions educated in military court. Flake says the FBI recently advised him that it can't determine if any of these convictions have been reported to any federal database. Flake says the DOD has reported only one misdemeanor crime of domestic violence to the NICS since 2007. The letter follows Flake's introduction of the Domestic Violence Loophole Closure Act, a bill aimed to clarify the Gun Control Act of 1968 as it applies to the military. A baker is making his way to Supreme Court in his argument to refuse a cake for a same-sex couple. Reporter Bailey Boat shows us how the lawyers are testing the waters on the case in moot court. Early next month, justices will consider whether a cake maker's work merits First Amendment protection under the U.S. Constitution. But before the attorneys argue here, their arguments got a trial run here at the museum. While the setting was casual, the question was serious. Did Jack Phillips discriminate when he refused to sell a wedding cake to a gay couple? 
people need to kind of kind of draw out of move out of the emotional state of if, you know this is all about about someone's defini definition of marriage and it's not for david cortman the answer to that question is no cortman is with the scottsdale based alliance defending freedom that is representing phillips the owner of masterpiece cake shop saying phillips was invoking his first amendment rights regardless of your view on marriage regardless of your view on any specific issue the government should not compel anyone to speak a message they disagree with Riamar disagrees the bakery is seeking a constitutional right to discriminate. Mar of the ACLU represented the gay couple in this discussion. She said that regardless of the artistry Phillips puts into his cakes, it is still discrimination to refuse to serve them. This case is not about whether cakes are art, it's about whether the government can prohibit discrimination even when the product you happen to sell is artistic. The panel was moderated by four Supreme Court journalists, and they took their roles seriously. And that's simply not the case. But there has I think to be the a Chief principle. Justice's question was, let's, let's assume it's expressive. The next time the case will be heard, it will be for real on December 5th. In Washington, Bailey Vote, Cronkite News. After last week's elections and monumental wins for the transgender community, a transgender congressional candidate held a panel here in the Valley. Reporter Emily Richardson tells us how the norms of politics are changing. We're in the middle of Transgender Awareness Week, and to celebrate it, local members of the LGBTQ community gathered to discuss and explore issues they face in society. We have doctors, lawyers, nurses, construction workers. I'm, I transitioned while I was a police sergeant. According to the Williams Institute, 1.4 million adults in the United States identify as transgender. To help make the public more aware, Brianna Westbrook, a congressional candidate, and other members of the LGBTQ community came together to have a conversation about transgender's rights. It creates social change. Um, it is the conversation that brings progress. Stephanie Sherwood is a transgender woman who transitioned four years ago, but her first memory of struggling with her gender was in kindergarten. And there was a <laughs> child who was painted an easel. And I thought, that looks fun, I want to do that. And so she took a, kind of a smock thing and put it over my clothes so I wouldn't get paint on me. And I freaked out because it looked like a dress to me. And I remember, I still vividly remember thinking, oh my God, people are going to see me in this and no, I want to be a girl. Sherwood believes her coming out experience was easier than it is for most, but says it put her career in jeopardy. At the police department, there were, no, no one said anything to me, but there were people who had gone to the, to the union and also to the chief and asked them to stop me from transitioning. Members of the LGBTQ community believe the social norms are changing and soon being transgender will be accepted on a national scale. Because you have candidates like myself and other candidates across this country that are standing up for LGBT rights to bring the progress we need to create a better future. The public perception of transgender people has absolutely changed. Transgender Awareness Week leads up to Transgender Day of Remembrance on November 20th, honoring those who lost their lives to hate crimes. According to the Human Rights Campaign, so far this year, at least 25 transgender people have been violently killed. In the Broadcast Center, Emily Richardson, Cronkite News. The State Health Department released its annual Arizona Child Fatality Review today. It says 783 children died in Arizona in 2016, and researchers say 42% of those deaths could have been prevented. 71 children were killed in motor vehicle crashes last year, and nearly a third of those failure to use seatbelts or infant restraints contributed to the deaths. 79 children died due to unsafe sleeping situations. More than half suffocated from bed sharing with adults or other kids. And use of drugs or alcohol was a contributing factor in 14 percent of all child deaths. A committee in Arizona chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics uses this annual data to create education campaigns and push for policy changes to keep Arizona's kids protected. Western Union is getting ready to pay up. If you've fallen victim to wire transfer scams within the last 13 years, you may be eligible to get your money back. Approximately 10,000 Arizonans could receive more than $11 million in refunds as part, of this, uh, as part of the settlement reached by Attorney General Mark Burnovich and 49 other states with Western Union. The settlement, finalized in January, includes a $586 million fund to refund consumers who unknowingly wired money to scam artists. Customers have until February of next year to file a claim. Those who have not received a claim form are encouraged to apply for a refund by visiting westernunionremission.com. 
These days, cyber crimes can wreak havoc in more ways than we think. From fraudulent charges on a credit card to shutting down entire neighborhoods, nobody is safe from a cyber attack. And Kirika Omernia went to the grand opening of the Arizona Cyber Warfare Range today to find out one important way to protect against these attacks. Experts say that in Arizona alone, there are 7,200 cyber jobs available. People who go to the range can figure out what just, just what it takes to get a job in this field. We have a huge cybersecurity skills gap, but most people that are in the cybersecurity industry are so bad at their jobs that if they were in any other job, they would be arrested or indicted for fraud. Brett Scott is the co-founder of the Arizona Cyber Warfare Range. His company teamed up with Grand Canyon University to educate the public about cybersecurity. Scott says the range is available for anyone from a mom who wants to protect her kids to someone who wants to launch a career in the industry. Right now our enemies have it all over us and if we want to survive, we must get more people in this fight capable cyber warriors. I'm actually a security analyst at McKesson, so I work in the security operations center there. Nick Flahiff volunteers at the range. As an information technology professional, he says he doesn't fear the future of his career. The amount of open jobs, uh, they need people so badly, so they're willing to, you know, this is a field you don't need a college degree, you don't need any certifications, really all you need is, is hands-on experience. While Flahiff did not go to college, Carissa Nolan took a different path. She majors in information technology at GCU, and she discovered her love of cybersecurity in high school after her teacher was locked out of a computer. I told him, I was like, well, I can try to get into it if, like, it's not technically allowed, but if you're okay with it and you won't, like, get it, me in trouble, yeah, I'll do it. She now hopes to stop people who use that skill with bad intentions. Scott stresses the importance of people filling these jobs and what could happen if they don't. Better brush up on your foreign language skills because we're not going to have a country anymore. The range is free to use for anyone with an interest in this career. In the control room in Caracol, Marinia, Cronkite News. For undocumented immigrants, getting sick isn't as easy as a quick trip to the doctor. Coming up on Cronkite News, how a 100% free medical clinic is giving its patients peace of mind. Plus, lighting up the night sky. A fireball made an appearance in Arizona last night, and it was all caught on camera. I'm Judy Woodruff, anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour. The journalists of tomorrow face a fast-changing media landscape, but quality news remains vitally important to our communities, our country, and our world. At ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication, students learn solid, reliable reporting, holding the powerful accountable, and rebuilding the public's trust. The Cronkite School and Arizona PBS, preparing the next generation for a stronger future of journalism. At a time when some parts of the Latino community feel attacked and lacking in resources, One Valley Clinic has dedicated itself to giving hope to those immigrants who do not have access to health care coverage. Cronkite News reporter Alex Valdez shows us how this center is offering care and support to its patients. Alex? It can be daunting to try to get health care when someone doesn't speak the language or doesn't have the legal status to navigate an already complicated system. The mission of Phoenix Allies for Community Health Clinic is to cut through all that red tape and simply provide much needed and often not found medical care. Everywhere you go, you feel that position that pretty much everybody is against everybody. You come over here and you don't feel that. When Luis Edgar Chavez realized he needed medical care, he didn't know where to turn to. But a chance encounter brought him here to the Phoenix Allies for Community Health Clinic, which treats patients like Chavez, who was undocumented. One day I was uh, feeling really sick in the day, so they gave me some kind of like emergencies help with uh, an IV. Seems simple enough, but for certain parts of the immigrant community, finances, paperwork, or proper documentation can be roadblocks to getting the health care they need. But at Poch, that's not the case. 
The clinic located in West Phoenix has its doors open to whomever may need it, regardless of their status. The clinic is primarily run by volunteers and medical students with certified doctors doing occasional rounds. It's funded 100% through donations. Poch currently provides health care free of cost to the immigrant community. Immigrants often have trouble obtaining insurance or other health care assistance provided by the government. A lot of immigrants are here on visas and they have a green card. McMullen says Poch treats many chronic diseases among the immigrant community. Like hypertension, uh, diabetes, high cholesterol. For patients like Chavez, a place like Poch not only provides him with medical care, it also gives peace of mind. Like way easier to come over here and get health treatment and trying to go to a regular the hospital, other clinics. Poch is one of three Valley clinics that currently treats both documented and undocumented immigrants free of charge, with the number of patients they are able to see related to the amount of monetary donations they do receive. In the Broadcast Center, Alex Valdez, Cronkite News. Officials at the Arizona-Mexico border have cracked down on child drug smuggling. One former smuggler says he successfully took drugs across the border for years while on his way to school. 14-year-old Evaristo Pereta was arrested after he was caught smuggling meth and spent two years in prison. He has shared his story in hopes of convincing minors to stay far away from the smuggling activities. Border officials say many children are bribed into the act. Like any other child, you, you offer them something that they like, like a smartphone. Officials say meth is the most common drug smuggled because it is easy to hide. Parents are advised to educate their children on the dangers of the drug cartels and tell them to be alert of their surroundings while crossing into Arizona. Would you, be, would you dig for buried treasure at a baseball field? Coming up on Cronkite News, young scientists are getting down and dirty in Bisbee to search for history beneath the stands. Right now in Phoenix, it is 82 degrees outside, partly cloudy with a humidity of 14%. Now we are going to raise just a bit in temperature tomorrow, but does that mean that we're still on track for that winter weather? Stay tuned after this and we'll talk about it. I'm Ted Simons, host and managing editor of Arizona Horizon. Join us each weekday at 5.30 and 10 as we bring you the top newsmakers who impact the state. We cover the stories in depth that shape and affect our local communities, and we take the time to ensure that all voices are equally heard. For more than 30 years, Arizona Horizon has been your voice and your source for what matters most, right here on Arizona PBS. More than 100 years have passed since Ward Ballpark opened in Bisbee, Arizona, but its history hasn't been forgotten. Cronkite News reporter Bridget Dow traveled to Bisbee, where archaeology students are learning more about the historic field. Warren Ballpark opened in 1909 and is the longest continuously running ballpark in America. Through a partnership with Cochise College and Bisbee High School, one University of Arizona professor is digging up Bisbee's past. <laughs> While other students might spend their day off relaxing indoors, these young scientists are getting down in the dirt, looking for clues to Arizona's history. I think it's important to, to, to have a connection to our past. Um, it's, it's always very important. I, I think a lot of people feel like that. Um, and to be able to relate to, to where we came from, you know, who, who were, were our forefathers and and what did they do, and, and how, did, how did we get to where we are today? Robert Schoen, an associate professor of anthropology at the University of Arizona, says even though many famous ball players took to the field in Bisbee, he and his students are focused on the people who filled the stands here more than 100 years ago. We're digging underneath um, where stands used to be, or right now we have trenches uh, lined up just um, outside the grandstand uh, to see if uh, we can find anything that fans dropped 
uh, during their experience and what that might say about them. He and his team have already found several artifacts like a 1930s bus token and this old can top. Schoen says while the dig and its potential findings are interesting, more importantly, it's an opportunity for students to get hands-on experience like Bisbee High School sophomore Cecilia Garcia. I found a bone, but it wasn't a human bone, of course. But it was, a, um, I think, like a, a pig's bone or something, like, a, like someone was eating it or, or something like that. But it was pretty big. And um, we found like an orange crush bottle and we could identify it. My grandfather said that he remembered that. Shone says the dig has enough funding to continue through the spring semester. <laughs> Schoen says through the artifacts, they can learn more about the local economy back then, as well as where products sold at the old concessions were manufactured. Bridget Dowd, Cronkite News. If you blinked, you may have missed it. A bright flash lit up the Arizona night sky. This video from the City of Phoenix City Cam showed the fireball streaking across the night sky, just above Camelback Mountain. It happened around 8.30 last night, and you only had about four seconds to catch a glimpse. The American Meteor Society has gotten more than 100 reports from people about a fireball scene over several western states, including Arizona. Skiers and snowboarders are going to have to hold off on hitting the slopes at Arizona Snow Bowl. This is what it looks like there right now. There's no snow. That's why Snow Bowl announced they're postponing the opening again. This is what it should have looked like when they planned to open last week, but they pushed the opening to this Friday. Now they say they don't know when they'll open because warm temperatures are making it difficult to make snow. Now it may not be freezing, but it's finally been cold enough for me to take out my winter wardrobe. Yeah, now Christina, will the chilly weather stick around? I can confidently say that sweater weather is upon us and very likely to stay. So right now in Phoenix, it is 82 degrees outside, partly cloudy with a humidity of 12%. Taking a look at the entirety of the state, we are seeing our colder temperatures up north in the 60s and 50s with 57 in Flagstaff and 60 in the Grand Canyon, but in the 70s and 80s in the central. The southern part was 75 in Lake Havasu and 86 in Tucson. Now taking a peek closer to home, we are seeing our temperature in the 80s with 86 in Goodyear, 82 in Maricopa and 82 in Superior. Now I know we're bundling up here in Arizona, but that doesn't compare at all to the rest of the country where we have our freezing temperature in Bismarck at 28 and then over in Pittsburgh, we are seeing 47. But bringing it back to Arizona, back to home, we are gonna see a raise in temperature tomorrow with 86 on Thursday with a low of 60. Then through the weekend, we're gonna go back down to 80 by Sunday and then on Monday all the way through to Wednesday back up to 82 with a low of 58 on Wednesday. For Cronkite Weather, I'm Christiana Fadul. Job interviews can sometimes be intimidating. Coming up on Cronkite News, an Arizona foundation is trying to make those easier by teaching college students basic business manners. Fridays, it's at Cronkite News, your social sharing connection where you choose the news. Facebook likes and shares, tweets, retweets, and favorites. YouTube views and subscriptions. We're watching you watch us. From our digital home at cronkitenews.azpbs.org to your television, web browser, or mobile device. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Then join us for at Cronkite News, our weekly refresh, each Friday at 5 on Arizona PBS. This fall. I'm so excited. What? <laughs> from the inspiring to the amazing. We're in the presence of history. The compelling. He said, welcome home. It was just a powerful moment. To the astounding. <laughs> I promised myself I wouldn't cry. <laughs> and from the breathtaking. This is real. A journey to Mars. To the electrifying. We're going to change the world. All this and more. All this fall. Job and internship interviews can sometimes be intimidating, especially when the interview takes place over dinner. The Be a Leader Foundation and Blue Cross Blue Shield teamed up to host an etiquette dinner for college students across the valley last night. Reporter Nicole Gutierrez shows us how students are learning more than the basic business manners. Tight grip. Handshakes. Silverware. So eating is, is a quiet, 
unobtrusive. And table manners are just some of the things college students are being exposed to. I don't know anything about this. Omo Kumara is one of the many college students here to learn how to potentially make good impressions on employers. What you see here is an etiquette class. To help students begin to think about how they present themselves for their future clients, for future um, employers, all that kind of stuff to help them to kind of understand what is appropriate to do, what is not appropriate to do. Students that attend the etiquette dinner not only learn what fork and what knife to use and when to use them, but they also learn that the food isn't the most important part of a dinner. 85% of what employers really look at is how people can socialize with people more than the skills themselves. I think now if I go to another business event, I will know how to handle myself, how to eat and how to behave and what to what to wear before you even go in there. College coordinator Rachel Olson says it's not just what's on your resume that can land you a job. It's really about having the confidence to sit around a table with people that are interviewing you or that you're trying to impress. Confidence these students can take to the table. In Phoenix, Nicole Gutierrez, Cronkite News. Cronkite News is proud to be the news division of Arizona PBS. Here's what's coming up on Arizona Horizon and PBS NewsHour. Arizona Horizon will talk to State Superintendent of Public Instruction Diane Douglas about misallocated federal education funds. And we'll look at efforts to help those with criminal records get jobs. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour Down to Earth. What life is like for astronaut Scott Kelly after spending a year in space. That's Wednesday on the PBS News Hour. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.